Um, oh, good. Hang on. I can't seem to make the recording message go away. Oh, uh, maybe if you unfull screen first. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, let's right. So I'm Tom. Um, thank you all very much for showing up here. It's not at all nerve wracking that Bianca tweeted about it and then a bunch more people showed up, but I'm glad that people are so fascinated by it. I spent many years working on this and now I'm going to try and do the impossible and talk about something that took me four years of my life in 15 minutes. And then also talk about it without getting bogged down in academic jargon and without talking about all the beautiful police drama that's going on today, even though it's relevant. Um, <clears throat> so this was most of my PhD at Queens. Um, and uh, it got published about a year ago. And I've been slowly trying to figure out how to sort of turn this into something slightly more accessible. And then when I found about this group, it seemed to me that this would be an excellent way to kind of spread the word and try and get from what was an incredibly abstract and sort of theoretical piece to something that might be a bit more useful to people who are actually doing really good work to figure out alternative ways of thinking about the intersections of tech and policing and society and smart cities and all that other stuff that seems to be going on. So this is my sort of 15 minute stab at explaining what I did and maybe why it might have bearing to this group. So my research was on these real-time operation centers that I discovered pretty much by chance while doing a different project for Queens. I realized that police all over Canada were building these strange um, sort of sci-fi like operation centers. And when I started talking to the people, they had really strange answers about why they were doing it and what they were supposed to be for. And then some of them stopped talking to me and I figured, well, this is definitely worth pursuing then if they don't want to talk to me about it. So I want to try and get at four main questions about these centers in the sort of remaining minutes that we have here. What are they? Why were they built? What effects are they having? And how are people rethinking civic tech and policing in light of what these centers represent for technology and society and policing? So the centers look something like this. This is a picture taken from inside the Ottawa Police Center, which I'm sure is incredibly embattled right now. See, I can't not talk about it. Um, this may be a slightly old picture. I think the center has been renovated in the meantime, but they all look more or less like this. Like somebody watched Minority Report and saw all the big screens and the computers and the maps and, you know, those, movies where they have the, they follow the criminal down the road with CCTV cameras in high res and then say something like release the drones and the drones track them all over the place, all being controlled from the central location. That's effectively what they were trying to build. And except it doesn't actually look like Star Trek. So it looks more like this. However, um, they were all kind of built at random and not really connected to one another. And over time, over the last two, 12 years now, they have sprung up all over Canada, as I found out, found out, everywhere from Vancouver to Halifax. And the ones that I was able to gain some degree of access to and can talk about in, to some level um, were in York, Niagara, Ottawa, Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver. The Toronto police flat out refused every single attempt on my part to gain access to them or request documents on them or anything else like that, as did the Halifax police. 
um, and my French wasn't good enough to approach the police in Montreal. So, although I suspect they have one too. And then on the sort of provincial and federal levels, I'm pretty sure they exist too. The OPP definitely has one somewhere, the RCMP as well, but I decided to keep my project relatively circumspect. So these are the ones that I know something about. So they're pretty widespread. And when you start asking the police what they're supposed to be, you generally get a kind of what are they for response, um, which is relatively informative. And you get things like they are updates for policing to deal with the new digital age, or this was my favorite, modifying time-tested policing techniques with new technology to create 24-7 tactical intelligence-driven hubs. It all sounds very kind of sci-fi and space agey. And when you dig into it a little bit more, they go from this, what are they for, to descriptions of the kinds of technologies that they want to integrate into these centers. They'll say things like, oh, we want to include social media monitoring in everyday policing, or we need to centralize sort of working up uh, packages on photos for potential suspects, or you get entire lists like this. This was from one document that I managed to get back via access to information requests. Um, and it's pretty reflective of what most of the centers are either doing or trying to do technology wise, but there wasn't a lot of clarity on why. They seem to want all sorts of data collection capabilities in one place and data collection with the aim to, as I've found out over time, really bring a kind of <clears throat> intelligence agency level surveillance to frontline policing. So that when cops are responding to a call, they can be provided with quote unquote, intelligence work um, from all sorts of digital surveillance service, services. Now, that's all fine and well, until you start asking them why they were built. And that's when the research starts getting a lot more interesting because you get past the kind of technocratic response, oh, we need to respond to things on social media or, um, we need to do more data analytics to be fit for the 21st century, you know, that kind of vague response. When I started actually having more in-depth conversations with the people responsible for developing the projects, um, two main responses come up as kind of themes for why these centers should exist. The one is a continuation of the digital environment theme that police genuinely felt that they were falling behind in the kind of digitalization of society and they needed to be able to operate in this environment more effectively, et cetera. And that they thought that this sort of approach of the real-time operation center with its technologies was the right response to this new digital environment. Okay, we'll get back to that in a little bit. The other theme that is arguably, I think, more important is that many of them were born out of a sense of crisis or an actual crisis. Like the center in Ottawa was spun up after the 2014 Parliament Hill shooting when they realized that they did not have the capacity to handle an event like that, which once again raises questions about what they're going to do now. And the same was in Niagara. They realized that they had all these cameras from, um, from the parks that they used to watch tourists and also potential suicides, it turns out. But they couldn't actually handle the number of cameras and there was this crisis around camera management. The city wanted them to do more and they realized they couldn't handle it. So they built the center to do more CCTV surveillance. For the Calgary center, apparently um, there was a suicide that was announced online on social media and the Calgary police were blamed for not catching it and as a result decided to spin up this center that would focus more on social media surveillance to prevent this. It's kind of an iffy rationale, but there you go. So there are a lot of these sort of responses to crises that were answered with doing more with technology. That was always the kind of 
go-to solution to the problems that they found themselves faced with. Oh, we will just adapt using this digital environment technology that will be our solution to these problems. But as I dug into the development, the sort of trajectory of these centers over the last, some of them are 10 years old, but most of them more like four or five years old, what they are currently for now, what they're doing now, doesn't follow from why they were built originally. They have mutated so much over the last four years, come to mean so many more things and to be used for so many more different things, that they don't resemble in many ways the original idea. In fact, it became clear that, no, not yet, that that was one of their sort of core functionalities was in fact being mutable and being able to do all these things and apply technological solutions to every new problem that sprung up around policing. Were they struggling to have an overview of their force disposition? Oh, the surveillance center will handle that. Do they need to do something more on social media? Oh, the surveillance center will handle that. You know, do they need to li liaise more with other organizations? Oh, right, the surveillance center will handle that. So the surveillance center became the kind of go-to solution for any new problem that arose. And so that's one sort of interesting strand, but it didn't really answer the question, why this form of technology? Like why is this sort of intensely surveillance driven solution always being proposed for such a wide variety of problems? And the answer, unfortunately, has to do with 9-11 and the post 9-11 war on terror, sort of Department of Homeland Security style counterterrorism that the US launched and then sort of trickled through into many other countries. And this quote that I have here is directly from a document, the founding document of the Vancouver Operations Center where they explicitly draw this lineage and say, yes, our sort of the original founding centers were in fact counterterrorism centers designed to hunt terrorists in the US and explicitly born out of a state of emergency. And that all these tools, all these um, like data collection and algorithmic analyses and CCTV and biometric tools that they all use were originally counterterrorism tools, and they just kind of stayed on, and they function crept from counterterrorism into. It was first. It was then um, major crimes, and now in Canada, they're basically being used as sort of intelligence backup for everyday policing. And that's where uh, things get really interesting, and I think we have an opportunity to start pushing back. And that's kind of where I wanna go with this talk from here on, because the effects of this are quite significant. So most of my dissertation is about how this sort of counterterrorism technology thinking is changing the way policing is being done. But what I've since learned since sort of publishing it a while back and thinking more about the whole thing is these centers, because they're meant to be mutable and they're meant to network with technological systems outside of policing, they're also introducing this mentality of opacity, military grade surveillance, of lack of civilian or public oversight into so many other systems. Police procurement is already very opaque and the usage of these systems is equally so. And that was kind of an ideal breeding ground to bring in more military grade surveillance. We've seen scandals in Canada over the last few years. I distinctly remember the IMSI scandal from a couple of years back when it turned out the police were using military grade surveillance devices that nobody had ever really heard of before. This is all part of the same kind of creeping usage of these technologies that was supported after 9-11 and has now trickled down into everyday policing. So what's happened through this is you're getting this blurring between what is policing technology and what is civilian technology because, ah, yes, I wanted to show this slide first before I get into that. This was from um, a sort of 
technology document that IBM and KPMG developed for the OPS as a kind of what should your police force be like in the 21st century style thing. And they're explicitly <clears throat> highlighting how the police force as a sort of social and technical and organizational system goes far beyond the sort of established or commonplace understandings of what policing is and connects to so many more systems. Uh, here they talk about first responders, an automated collection of data from a wide variety of sources, many of which are civilian or private data brokers or other parts of the government. And all of it in this sort of attempt to create a much bigger surveillance apparatus that would provide information to first responders. So how is that really being done? Um, when you look at how these sort of systems are interconnected through so many different other non-policing technological systems, these uh, real-time operation centers are drawing on traffic cameras, toll road license plate readers, private and semi-private CCTV networks. So a number of the operation centers told me about how they had or were developing MOUs with places like malls and campuses and BIAs to use their cameras, uh, using private data brokers to gather even more data and connect even more databases, and other governmental databases as well. And it, uh, I realized during this research that it wasn't just that these centers were supposed to be sort of future ready, future anticipating for this new digital ecosystem that they were supposed to function in, but they were also future precipitating in a way. Their whole purpose was to bring about this kind of surveillance-based future and that they were actively working to uh, introduce this um, sort of militarized surveillance idea into other uh, digital infrastructure systems around them. And so restructuring the very kind of technical uh, infrastructure and ecosystem um, that we live in. They were kind of a, like a stalking horse for military grade surveillance that would go beyond policing. Many of the officers talk very excitedly about uh, smart city projects that they saw as kind of kindred spirits to what they were building with these RTOCs, that they would be able to tap into the internet of things developed by these smart cities and use all this data for their own purposes. So <clears throat> they had a variety of wild plans, some of which, um, I mean, I wrote it down, so they definitely said it, but they talked about doing things like increasing surveillance for at-risk populations, like RFID, RFID chips for dementia patients. I don't know, that <laughs> they definitely said that. I'm not sure they're actually ever going to do that. It sounds too dystopian, even for them, but that was said, um, they definitely, had programs of watching for self-harm on social media, um, integrating the Saskatchewan hub welfare system into these RTOCs to so become sort of part of the surveillance network. And whether or not these uh, sort of integrations actually happen, they were all mostly speculative at the time, it does show that the ideas behind these centers is very much to use them as a way of furthering this sort of technocratic surveillance-based, pretty secretive way of organizing technology in our society, um, which made me realize that really, when you're thinking about alternative ways of organizing technology in society, you have to think about that including the police force. There's, there's no way of thinking outside of that. It is so enmeshed in the way that technology is being developed, digital technology is being developed, that we have to think about rethinking governance of civilian tech and policing tech at the same time. There is no real disentangling of these. And that's about as far as my sort of thesis really got. 
and then after that, I spent some time um, looking at what alternatives uh, groups all over the world had developed. So we, we live in a time of where the sort of Overton window on public discourse and policing has been shifted far enough that thinking about abolition has become, if not commonplace, then at least somewhat acceptable. And there are groups springing up all over the place that are thinking about alternatives. So I started looking for these groups that were particularly thinking about alternatives from a tech perspective. What alternative technologies or organizations could be put in place to think about alternatives to this kind of creeping militarized form of surveillance driven technology. And it turns out luckily there are quite a few. So quite recently uh, in San Diego, the Tech Workers Coalition together with a few community orgs realized that the city had introduced smart street lamps that were also smuggling in a kind of secret CCTV network that was to be run by the police. Um, they only realized about a year or something like that after it had been operational, but they found out and they put together the Transparent and Responsible Use of Surveillance Technology San Diego Trust Coalition. And they managed to get the city to back down and take them down. Not only did they do that, but they also developed, which you can see under the link here, a whole new ordinance that was then, I think, partially accepted by the city that would give significant public oversight over the introduction of similar technologies in the future. And there have been similar successful projects in Oakland and Seattle as well. Um, and then I found another one that is really interesting. It's a project called Rahim. They started out as a civic tech group that built a platform uh, just to help people report on instances of police violence, but quickly realized that they needed to do much more and are currently uh, together with Slack, interestingly enough, developing an alternative to 911 that would link directly to non-policing response teams for people in crisis. Uh, this is happening right now. You can go on their website and see the progress they're making. It's fascinating. Very, very curious to see what comes of this project. Uh, another one has been Speak Up Austin, which was sort of a really broad civic tech project to facilitate community engagement in Austin. Um, this a whole range of projects happening on their website, but one of the more interesting ones they're doing is uh, facilitating a rewriting of the Austin Police Department's body worn and dashboard cameras policy, which is, I think, a really good thing and interesting thing for a civic tech group to be doing, very similar to what is happening in San Diego. And then there are a whole bunch of uh, sort of crowdsourcing, information crowdsourcing tools built by civic tech groups around the world. One I really like is Transparency IT in Nigeria. Two civic tech activists developed this uh, tool to collect and analyze data about the police in Nigeria and then publish it. And apparently it's been quite effective. Uh, the EFF has their Atlas of Surveillance Project, which is another sort of crowdsourcing tool where people can take pictures of unknown surveillance technologies and upload them and have them identified and then put on a whole map of which police force has what. And then there are a range of um, sort of open data style projects uh, developed by civic tech groups um, some of them seem to be a kind of sort of open washing, as somebody once called them, projects that don't aren't really kind of open government, but Ursus seems to be better. I don't know, we'll see. Um, but these are other examples of sort of civic tech things that people have been done. And at that, I am very much running out of time. So I uh, will leave you with resistance isn't futile and alternatives are possible. And thank you for listening to my talk.